The Bible, 66 unique books, written by over 30 authors with 15 different professions in 11 geographic locations. It contains 10 writing styles in three languages, compiled over a 1,500-year time span. It deals with topics as controversial as the nature of God, man, and salvation, yet without error. Must be a God thing. Riverside Church located at 3045 Richardson Bridge Road in Princeton, North Carolina. Join us as we unleash the Bible one verse at a time. If you would tonight, grab your Bible, turn to 1 Kings as we're picking up tonight in 1 Kings chapter 19. I do hope that you have a copy of God's Holy Word tonight as we're studying 1 Kings. Uh, I want to remind you that we choose to believe the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. It reports supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of prophecy. It's divine, not human in origin. We here at the river believe in the five solas, and of course you know them, but we'll go through them quickly. We believe in the Bible alone. We believe in faith alone. We believe in Christ alone. We believe in grace alone. We believe that God alone receives the glory, and we certainly will receive the glory here tonight as we study God's Word together. As we turn to 1 Kings chapter 19, if you remember the last time we were together, our protagonist, our hero of the story, Elijah, well really he's not the hero. He's somebody that's getting help from the hero. God is always the hero of every story we read in the Bible. We see that Elijah now has, has drawn a line in the sand before Israel. Remember Israel, the northern kingdom uh, that went under the fold of Jeroboam and also went apostate because he pulled the people away to idolatry. He called the people to a showdown at Mount Car Carmel and he had uh, 450 false prophets as well as the other 500, uh, 400 and that was 850 false prophets that were there at the showdown and of course Elijah was used by God mightily and the fire came down and lapped up the water in the trenches around the idol uh, not around the idol but around the altar and also that day is when the day of Israel repented and they slaughtered those false teachers and preachers at, at such a great moment you would think Elijah would be flying high well as we finished last week we looked in 18 when Elijah goes up on top of the mountain with his servant and he prays seven times. We spoke about how whenever he was praying, it took seven times. Of course, James chapter number five told us that our friend Elijah is much like us in our infirmities, in our weaknesses. He prayed. God didn't answer in the instance like he did when the fire fell, but it took seven times. I, I want to reiterate that for those who are listening and listening by podcast and who are present tonight. Many times God will answer right away, and sometimes it will take up to seven times. Sometimes it would take up seven times 70. What changed in that moment? Was God trying to be persuaded? Did God had to be persuaded to do the thing that he already said he was going to do? He already told, you, he already told Elijah that he will send the rain on the nation. Why did he have to pray seven times? Well, after such a great victory, God was working on Elijah. Because remember, Elijah is just like us. How big-headed, how pig-headed, and how egocentric we will become if we have God at our beck and call and we have might and power. We might get a little cocky and believe that we're the ones that are strong. In that instance, in the seven times he prayed, whenever the, 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 the servant would go and look and he'd say, is there any change? No, there's no change. He would continue to pray, asking God to do what he said. Now, how does that apply to us as believers in this modern day time? In the middle of the prayer, I'm asking you to continue to pray. I'm asking you to continue to ask God. Maybe you're saying, I've asked more than seven times. Maybe I've asked one or two times, and I guess God don't want to do it. Continue to pray. It, maybe there's not been much change. Maybe the, the, they're not acting like that. Maybe things have gotten worse. Maybe the atmosphere has gotten a little bit drier and there's no rain. Continue to pray. That's what we learned from this text, that God has promised that he will seek out the wayward, the prodigal, that he will save the sinner. Continue to pray that God will do what he said he'll do. But you say, well, am I convincing God? No, maybe he's convincing you that he's going to do what he said. 
in the prayer. Elijah sees now that a, 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 a cloud the size of a hand comes up out of the water. And know what he does? He starts to run. He actually runs. He outruns Ahab who was going to meet him in another place. So now we have the, the background in place and we reiterated a couple of things and I made sure that you remember picking up in 1 Kings chapter number 19 Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Mm, told on him. Uh, let me tell you, baby, let me tell you what happened. It was Elijah who did all this. First of all, I'm sure it must be the fact that he, he crumbled before Jezebel because it wasn't Elijah who did it. We must remember that he was just the instrument that God used. It was not Elijah who brought the fire. It was God. But you must remember who Jezebel is. She is a high priestess. She's the daughter of a high priest of a false god of Baal. So he did not go into her presence saying that Yahweh is the one true God. In fact, when all this went down, Ahab actually drew quiet. He was awestruck, thunderstruck at the fact that God brought down fire and they killed all the high priests of Baal. So when he gets in the presence of his wife, he crumbles like a cheap sand castle. It's true that men who are generally mighty, they will crumble in the presence of their wives and kids. They fold like a cheap lawn chair. They don't lead their family like they ought to. So we see that Ahab is generally a, a, a reflection of many people in our society when he gets in Jezebel's presence because maybe she's overpowering, maybe she's demanding. Absolutely she was because she had, to, had her finger on the pulse of society dragging them to apostasy. But when he got in her presence he, he, t he said, Elijah did all this and how he killed all the prophets with the sword all your people all the people that you had raised up in your academies and all the people that you had trained Elijah killed on Jezebel so we see in verse 2 then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying say so that so that may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of them by this time tomorrow Jezebel sends the message to the man of God. You would think that Elijah would not be afraid because he just had a wonderful moment on Mount Carmel. However, when the threat, the threat comes, it strikes him to the heart. Maybe the fact that it comes from a woman, I don't know. It might be that, I don't know. But we see here that a woman scorn, you know the phrase, and she has a vendetta against Elijah now. She says, may the gods deal with me. First of all, I want to remind you that the gods, lowercase g, found in your text, could not even defend their prophets on the day of Mount Carmel. How would the gods do anything to Elijah? I, I want to remind you, as we read here, we might look at Elijah and say, man, you're overreacting. Why are you running from this moment? Why are you scared of the swearing that Jezebel has towards you? But before we point fingers and before we pick on Elijah, how quickly we do the same. Whenever we pray to God and ask Him to send fire or send rain in our lives, that He would heal, save, and redeem, how quickly we fold whenever trouble comes our way. Whenever that unexpected bill shows up, whenever something is found in the doctor's MRI, whenever we hear of bad news or trouble around the way, we fold before God because we're just like Elijah. Before we throw stones at Elijah, let us look at our own masonry work. Look at our own lives. And before we pick on Elijah here, we, would, we need to remember <laughs> it, it was God who did the fire. It was God who lapped up the water. It was God who did this. It, it, it's just as Romans chapter number 1 verse 28 tells us, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to a debased mind to do what they ought not to be done. We've got to remember here that it was not Elijah who brought the fire. It was, it was God. And Jezebel hates the man of God and is going after the man of God. I want to remind you that it, whenever you have a godly preacher, whenever you have a godly pastor or a godly evangelist, if they're, if they're faithful to the Word of God, you will, not be you will not be neutral about your sin. You're either going to hate that man of God or you're going to hate your sin. You, you will have a different relationship with sin. Whenever you have an encounter with God. 
Because your relationship with God has changed. Now you're in right standing. You once were an enemy of God, but now your relationship has changed. Let me bring it down and put it on the bottom shelf so everybody can understand. Once you get married, you're, you're with that spouse. Your relationship with that spouse changes and you are dedicated to them only. But also your relationship with every other man or woman in the world changes as well. You're in spouse to them now. You're dedicated to them. But also your relationship with everybody else changes as well. That means I, this is a shut door right here. This is us. And now my relationship with you, there's only so many lines that you can cross. You can't come here. That is true with the Christian and with sin. The Christian does not open his front door, open the windows, and kick out the back wall when it comes to sin. That he is dedicated, submitted, and committed to Christ and Christ alone. I don't know how we got on that, but let's keep going. In verse 2, we see that Jezebel says, Do so more to me if I don't also make your life as one of them by this time tomorrow. The threats that we see come. We, uh, we need to understand that Ahab has not repented. He was just caught up in the moment. Because if he had repented, then the situation would be different. He would say to Jezebel, No, 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 I, I was there. I saw what took place. I saw the fire come down from heaven. I saw the prophets of Baal speak and cry out to a false god for six hours. She only heard about it. She only heard what took place. He had a moment to influence her and maybe even save her life and let alone her soul. Uh, reminding you in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children will be unclean, but it, as it is, they are holy. Continuing in verse 16, For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? In this text in 1 Corinthians, which we'll be starting coming up in about a week or so, we'll examine that sometimes God will use your spouse. Sometimes God will use your enemy. Sometimes God will use your neighbor. And it will cause you to be caught up as a testimony. But we see here that Ahab missed the opportunity to be a testimony in the house of his own house. But we also understand that Ahab had not repented and converted over to being a one true believer of the one true God, even though the evidence was burning in his face. So we understand now in verse 3, then he was afraid. Of course he was afraid. Of course this man was frightened. But before we read the rest of the verse, Christian, I want to let you know that the enemies of God are always kept on chains. Even though she's breathing threats towards Elijah, it's good for you to learn in this instance, in this moment, that your own enemies are kept on chains. That they can do more, they cannot do more or less than God even allows. For let me explain, in Numbers chapter 22, verse 18, for those who are taking notes, Numbers 22, 18. But Balaam answered and said to the servant of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do more or less. Here we have a, even a false prophet, a mercenary, who was bought to prophesy over the people of Israel, but he couldn't say more or less than God would even allow. So then again, Elijah still scared. I want to remind you that in Proverbs 21, verse number 1, the king's heart is is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. That is the sovereignty of God. I tell you, God's sovereignty makes a soft pillow to know that God is in control. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19, For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness, that God is wiser than all those who scheme against the people of God. I remind you again that the devil is still God's devil. He keeps him on a leash. Have you never read the book of Job? He only goes as far as God allows him. So we understand here, then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, left his servant there. I will let you know from the place where he runs, from Mount Carmel to Mount Sheba is 150 miles. He runs. Something about being scared, you can run. Here we see that Elijah runs from the enemies of God, even though he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. Isn't it just like us to look at Elijah and say, I can relate to that. 
that there might be a, a monumental moment in our life where you serve the Lord and He has blessed you immensely, but then maybe a day or week or hours later, your heart is broken and you wonder if there's a God even uh, paying attention to your situation. We do well to read the text and apply it to our own lives and see how God deals with somebody who's disgruntled, heartbroken, and scared. Because that's really what the story's about. The prophet who's running from someone who really can't hurt them unless God allows it. We know that all things work towards good, even though the good may not be good. It's for our good and for his glory, ultimately, Romans 8, 28. As we continue, he says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. In in verse number 4, he says, I'm no better than my father's. Did you notice that? In his valley moment, he says, I'm no better than those that came before me. So what that tells me is that Elijah dealt with pride. He he had a time where he thought he was better than his fathers. Maybe it was on Mount Carmel when the fire came down. Maybe it was whenever he was killing the prophets that were false and laying them out before Israel and before God. But now he's admitting, I'm no better than my fathers. As wishy-washy and as broken as they are, I I come to myself, I just want to die. Have you ever prayed that? If you had never prayed that, then you ain't been through nothing. Then you surely cannot relate. It's in those dark places where you really find the lily in the valley. Hey, mean somebody. Here, he lays under a broom tree, which is really a shrub in the heat of the day, in the desert. He cries out, it's enough now, O Lord. Take my life, for I'm no better than my father. You've got to understand, he's a man just like everybody here, flesh and bone. We think he's super, supernatural. However, he did show up at the transfiguration. Do you remember when Jesus was transfigured before his disciples? There was Elijah. He will be taken up later. I don't want to spoil anything, but I do hope you know your Bible well enough that he'll be took up in a whirlwind before God. But yet the Bible says he's just like us. He prayed to God and God answered his prayers. We see that he, he cries out. He says, I'm no better than my father's. I want to die. It's enough, Lord. Take my life. And he laid down and slept under the broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. I I, want to let you know that the angel that spoke to him there, we've seen the angel before. It's the same angel who spoke with Abraham when Abraham was sitting under the trees in the cool of the day and the angel walks up on the way to Sodom and Gomorrah. And you remember the conversation that Abraham had with that angel and the other two that were with him? Angel here is used as the messenger of the Lord. We also believe that as a pre-incarnate Christ. It was Jesus that was walking with Abraham, speaking. And as Abraham was, he was talking and trying to plead with the Lord, saying, will you find 50? Will you still destroy the whole city? He says, no, if I find 50, I won't destroy it. And he gets them down to 10, yet there were not even 10. And he says, will not the Lord of all creation do what's right? And Jesus always does what's right. We also know that the angel of the Lord is found in other places, speaking to Gideon. If you remember, he was treading the the wheat in the wine press in the valley away from the enemy. And Jesus speaks to him and says, Oh, man of valor. He was not a man of valor, but Jesus called him that, speaking those things that are not as though they were. Yet again, we see that the angel also was walking with Moses in the wilderness, leading as a shepherd the fire by night and the cloud by day, the angel. Here we see the angel kicking now. Elijah waking him up from his exhausted slumber. And what does the angel do? Well, it's just like Jesus to be a tender shepherd. What does he do? He touched him and said, Arise and eat. For Elijah had ran 150 miles, let alone killed 850 enemy prophets, false prophets, and, and, and did a great stand before the people of God. This man wants to die as he lays under the broom, broom brush or under the, the, little, the little weed of the, 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 the wilderness. And then Jesus or the prophet or Jesus or the angel of the Lord tells him, Wakes up, wake up and eat. Take a, take a moment, just rest. Here what we can learn that as Elijah is much like us, There ain't nothing unbiblical about a snack and a nap. 
Amen, somebody. Sometimes you just need a sandwich and take a nap. Truly, whenever your body is falling apart, it casts a big shadow over your spirituality. That's why we must rest and take care of God's temple. That we must rest and have our minds able to rest. Here, Elijah is exhausted and he wakes him up and he says, rise and eat. How? What's, what is there to eat? In verse 6, and he looked and behold, there was at the head of his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. This was the same Jesus who brought the manna to the children of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years. Supernatural, supernatural food. Basically, soul food. It was was literally food, but it also nursed his body. He needed to rest after the fight that he went through. That's the thing about our Jesus. He understands our emotional states. He understands our physical states. He understands our spiritual state, and He takes care of them all. Don't believe me, read. For He tells them to rise and eat. Much like the water that came out of the rock in the wilderness, there's water there for Elijah. Hot cakes ready to eat. Much like the cakes that the widow provided for him when he was in hiding, there God provided. What do you learn here? That the angel of the Lord is Jehovah Jireh, our God, who will provide. Let me just say it again and say it slower for people like me. God provides Jehovah Jireh. He will provide. He will provide when the state won't provide, when the job won't provide, and when you can't even provide. Our God will provide. Amen, amen. Notice he tells them to lay down again. Rest again. Catch up on that rest. Sleep. There's a reason. Well, we also know that Psalms 23 says he, he leads me beside the still waters. He brings me there to rest. He maketh me lie down. He makes me lie down. Has anybody ever made you lie down? Has a shepherd ever came and pressed you down into the lush grass and made you rest? Because we tend to work ourselves into a frenzy. That's why God rested on the seventh day. Not that he was tired or wore out. He says, do what I do. Our God is mighty and strong. He was not weakened on the Sabbath day and needed to get into his lazy boy and rest. But we need to. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. Christian, I just want to say this to you. Don't quit. Rest. Just rest. Rest in His graces and His mercies. The Bible tells us in Galatians, don't give up in doing good. That's true. Let it ring from the pulpit to the pew and back and forth. And the angel of the Lord in verse 7 came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. Here we see the tenderness of our Christ, our pre-incarnate Christ, our God speaking to Elijah, get up and eat again and lay back down and rest because the journey is too great. You might say, well, tomorrow is going to be overwhelming. Tomorrow is going to take me out. Learn from Elijah and rest. For God provided for Elijah. He always provides I want to let you know in Psalms 103, verse 13 through 14, as a father shows compassion on his children, so the Lord shows compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our frame, and he remembers we are only dust. The tenderness and the mercies of God. He used an angel here. He used a messenger from God. I want to let you know in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who inherit salvation? Who we see that God uses angels. He uses a pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, Our God is involved in our lives. Our God is not one who spins the earth like a Harlem Globetrotter and walks away as it spins. Our God is involved. Our God cares. That's wonderful to know. Do you feel disconnected from God? Do you feel discombobulated? Do you feel disconnected from the body? Well, it's probably because you've not read what God has done and what God is doing. 
and you have not realized and come into his presence with thanksgiving. Notice you come and you thank him for what he's already done. And when you realize what he's already done, then you know that he will provide for today and tomorrow and 10, 20 years from now. For our God provides. Our God heals. Our God walks with us and he talks with us and he calls us his very own. We understand here that he says the journey is too great. If he had not rested, if he had not ate, he would have become overwhelmed. And the thing is, our God knows better than we do. Oh, I got this. It won't be long before you're laying on your back. It won't be long before you're caught up and broken, being overwhelmed. And God says this overwhelming for you is too great. So let us do what God commands us to do. Whew, amen. We see in verse 8, And he rose and ate and drank, and went in strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Herob, the mount of God. This is another 125-mile trek. Notice whenever he hides, he goes down to the southern nation of Judah. He goes there whenever he leaves from the area of uh, Ahab. He runs there, but now he has another 125 trek that he does, but he does it in the power of the soul food that God gives. Christian, I want to let you know that tomorrow we'll have troubles. Tomorrow will be hard. There will be struggles that you will face, but there's soul food for you. There's strength for the journey. He always provides. He doesn't send you out to perish. He walks with you like I already spoke about, but He will strengthen you and nurture you for whatever ails you around the way. Our God walks with us in the valleys, but He gives us strength to the weak and the feeble. I want to let you know, the God who watched over Elijah as he slept is the same God in Psalms 121 verse 4. Behold, He who keeps Israel will neither sleep nor slumber. Amen. That when I go to sleep at night, it's God who watches over me. I I know I've got a dog and I might have a 38 special under my pillow, but those things don't protect me. It's God who protects me. Psalms 127 verse 2, It is in vain that you rise up early and go to late rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he keeps his beloved with sleep. We see in Psalms 127 verse 2, he gives his beloved rest and sleep. We can see in verse 8 that he provided the soul food that he needed. Deuteronomy 8, 3, and he, and he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know what man does not live by bread alone, but by what, what lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Our God provides. Our God gives. And we see now that he has trekked another 125 miles. And we find ourselves in verse number 9. And he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here? Christian, what we could glean from this text is why in the world would the Lord's word come to him? Why would God even send an angel to help him? He's laying in the desert wishing he would die. But then again, we see the loving, steadfast, pursuing love of God to his people. The word of the Lord came to Elijah, and he did not deserve it. He was laying under a a small bush saying, I'm worse than my forefathers. I'm weaker than them. I just want to die. But the thing is, God's not done. He's not done with Elijah, and he's not done with you, Christian. No matter your spiritual state or your brokenness of your body, here the Lord comes to Elijah yet again when Elijah does not deserve it. What are you doing here? Do you remember? He said the same thing thing to Adam in the cool of the day as he walked in the garden. He knew where Adam was. He could see through the trees. He could see through Adam. He knew that Adam was falling. But Adam was falling, and he whispers, Adam will argue a rhetorical question. Look at where you are. You're far from me. He asked, Elijah, what are you doing?